Hey everyone, welcome to Web Sleuth's YouTube Live. My name is Trisha Griffith. I am the very proud owner of WebSleuth.com. I think the best true crime discussion forum in the universe. And of course, we have to have our hamster here. He's our protection hamster. He's an attack hamster in case anybody bugs us tonight. He'll attack him. <laughs> stay there. Don't fall down, you big fat hamster. That's what people say to me. Don't fall down, you big fat hamster. Come on. <laughs> Anyway, and of course, we have our very own Stephanie Stacy, or we just like to call her insightful one with us. And you recognize this gentleman, Joseph Scott Morgan. He is a host of the podcast Body Bags. It has shot up the charts. Uh, I think it was even number one in true crime if it isn't still. And we've bought his book. Come on now. You do have a copy of Blood Beneath My Feet. Uh, now, Joseph Scott Morgan began as a death investigator working in the New Orleans, uh, um, mor not mortuary, the, uh, what was it called you worked in? My mind is blank. <laughs> yeah, I was with the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office. Actually, actually, if you look up on the board right here, this is a, a picture of me in our old dilapidated, broken down morgue when my hair was really, really dark. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, single table. And in that very room, we did uh, we did close to a thousand autopsies per year, and only had storage for four bodies at a time. So, how did you it do was, it? You did it. You didn't have a choice. There was no other where, no other place to go. You just you had to do it, and you sallied forth and did what you have to do, and you know, and uh, you you got to want to be there. So there were many days I'd walk in on the you know, in this room and there would be bodies just stacked on the floor actually. Uh. So it was, it was a great, it was a great environment oh, to gosh. train in great environment mm -hmm. to train in. So I'm very thankful for that time. And then after, uh, after a uh, number of years there, I became the senior investigator with a medical examiner in Atlanta mm -hmm. after that. And now, thankfully I'm a college professor. So that, I uh, bet you're I bet you're the greatest professor ever. Oh, uh, I bet your students just love you. Oh, uh, we have a good we have a good time. We're doing a uh, we're doing uh, doing a cold case class this semester, and uh -huh. I've gotten the class broken down into three oh. teams, and they're they're tackling um, tackling three three class uh, three cases of their own choosing, okay. and uh, working them. And they're about to, uh, semester's coming to a close, so I'm very excited about their. Uh, pending presentations and oh, uh, i bet so. uh, they'll make you proud i have no oh, I know, I know. we we have a good time in that class we good. really do and before we get into stephen smith and and a few other things i have asked you this before but it's been a long time since i've asked you and we have a lot of new people in our chat here and a lot of new uh subscribers being with your massive experience when you think of a case that it just is on your mind. What comes to your mind as the one case that you will never forget and you will just remember and it's right there in your brain all the time? Uh, that bastard Chris Watts. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I think that that's probably the one that jumps jumps to mind uh, uh -huh. first for me. Um, the slaughtering of those babies. And and to hell with anybody that supports him in prison that writes him a letter. I think, I think you're evil. Um, Good. You know, I, that's, that's my personal opinion of it. Uh, when, when you can see what he did to those babies and to his wife too, and that unborn child, um, you know, uh, I hope, I hope he's reminded of it. I hope he never sleeps. I hope he's haunted by, by nightmares. My regret in that case is they did not force him to allocute in court. And why, why do you think that is? That's what everybody was expecting. Yeah. And, and they didn't. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I covered that case from the day, literally the day it happened, I was mm -hmm. on air. They brought me in. I think it was with CNN. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, uh, I followed it from the very beginning. Um, when those kids were missing, uh, I had, you know, just a, a gut feeling that he was lying at the time, you know, mm -hmm. all that self-soothing stuff he was doing on the front porch of that house. I'll never forget that. Um, 
That's and um, <clears throat> and you know they made BTK allocute. He allocated, right. and and as a matter of fact, uh, if and I've mentioned this before, I know, and I can't get past it because I use it as a teaching tool. Um, mm -hmm. If if you guys ever want to send a chill up your spine at any point in time, go to YouTube and watch BTK allocute in court. He was forced to. Uh, he was uh, compelled to by the court. He had to tell mm -hmm. them specifically what he had done. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I think that, uh, I think that that was, that should have happened in this case. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think that anybody that rolls, that rolls over on a case and is, you know, essentially bartering for their life and that's on the table you know, uh, as a stipulation of that, I think that they should be compelled by the court to allocute. That's just my, that's my opinion. Well, and I don't understand why the prosecution didn't make that deal with him. I, I don't know. I, I, that still baffles me uh, to this day. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's, you know, maybe at this point it, it's moot. Um, uh, but I would have, uh, you know, I, that would have been my preference. Um Right. Uh, because I, you know, I hate the word closure because there is no such thing. That's, that's a lie that the public is sold by the mental health, uh, exactly. you know, uh, folks out there, they use that term, they throw it around. And, and to me, when, <clears throat> when people say, well, you'll get closure someday, it's almost like it, for me as a former death investigator and somebody that has made over 2000 in-person death notifications, mm -hmm. um, it's almost like you're telling the people, the person that's grieving, that's going through that. Um, okay. We've heard enough of your story. Move on. You'll get closure someday. Now we're going to move on. And it's very quick. It's very dirty. It's, uh, and it's, it's a uh, low IQ vocabulary, I think. Right. Uh, when we start to use that and it's thrown around a lot. It's thrown it, doesn't, around. it doesn't, it doesn't deal with the problems that people experience right. because nobody ever gets over death. <clears throat> Um, Kat's gallery, this is a good point, and then we'll move on here. Whoops, hold on. Kat's gallery says, the oil company didn't want the bad publicity, in my opinion. Do you think there could have been some pressure from, because it's a big employer there in Colorado, maybe they didn't want that gory detail of those babies in those oil tanks? Uh, you know, that that's an excellent point. And uh, I've got two pieces to that for me. I think that, um, I think that, probably um that might be the case i would assume that they they you know they they draw a lot of water in that in that county because mm -hmm. of just the the economic impact i don't know if that influenced anything i have no idea um but there's another piece to this i don't think by virtue of the choice that that person made with the uh, the disposal of those remains after this horrific crime I don't know that the public is fully aware of what he exposed those crime scene responders to, uh, because that was raw petroleum. You know, we heard a lot about how the bodies had broken down and, in kind of in a, in a relatively short period of time. And a lot of that is because, uh, raw petroleum contains things like toluene, which is one of the things that you use at, to like strip paint with. There, there's a lot of components in raw petroleum that were stored in there. And so when they, if you see, you go back and see that they have what's called the thief hatch, which is on top of the tanks. That's where he actually forced those babies down in there. Uh, when the oldest child actually had scratches on her backside as a result of that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, but there, there are these hatches on the side that have these gigantic bolts. They had to drain those tanks, released release those bolts, open it up, pardon me, open it up. And then the workers had to go in in environmental protection suits in order to re retrieve those bodies. Those workers were actually exposed to a very horrible environment. And to kick it up another notch, if you want another layer of horror to this, since he worked in that environment, he knew good and well what was contained in those tanks and he knew that if those remains were ever recovered uh that there was a high probability that the people that recovered them would be exposed to this so you know there's there's just uh, another 
another layer to this that I don't think uh, I, I've talked about it a couple of times on air uh, since since those times, but um, um, I, I think that it's there's another layer of horror to this that <coughs> he subjected that that community to. And uh, didn't the police officers involved as well in the retrieval of the bodies? They had to. Uh, well, I don't think they have to, but retired. I, I don't think they could take it anymore. And am I not mistaken in that? Yeah, I'd heard I'd heard snatches of that. I've never been able to confirm that, but I'd heard that, uh, Trish. And I, I got to tell you, it's um, it wouldn't surprise me because you know this is kind of an isolated area. Actually, this you guys might find this kind of interesting. And forgive me because I'll have to look up the the actual case. But you know, I covered another case that that happened in that same county. Uh, what is it? Weld Weld County. Uh, on body bags, and it was a double homicide that was recently adjudicated um, where, and I, I found it fascinating that uh, coincidentally, you know, we could have two, these, these two separate events that were so horrific. This guy had actually, and it was the same prosecutor that handled these cases. Um, hang on. I don't want to bore you guys with this, but um see if I can find it. Uh, actually, I had somebody contact me the other day regarding it. Nothing, nothing you say is ever boring. Uh, well, this, was, boring this, ever. Guy was, this guy was actually a, 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 um, a jazz musician that was murdered by another fellow up there with the aid of the murderer's girlfriend uh, who the murderer suspected the jazz musician of having an affair with and a week later he killed her um and it was it was an absolutely it was the scott what's the guy's last name the the victim's last name i can't recall i, I i'm sorry I, I can't remember but uh i'm sure somebody as bright as your followers are i know that somebody will pick up on this um but um his uh yeah it lured him into her apartment where this guy was laying in wait, the perpetrator, and cut his throat on the floor in this apartment, and then they disposed of uh, disposed of his body out there on one of these farms. Uh, partially burned the body, and when when the perpetrator was caught, he was found at a gas station getting another can of gasoline to go and burn the girlfriend's body, and they captured her captured him, uh, in the midst of that and found, found her, you know, found her, her deceased out there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll think of it in, <laughs> in that's a moment, a, but anyway, yeah, different. that, and that's in the same County. That's actually in the same County as, um, as, uh, as the Watts case. Uh, yeah. so yeah. Uh, what are, you know, what are the, what are the chances that yeah, something uh, that gruesome and awful and that it's a, it's a, not very populated. I mean, it's not hugely populated, I should say. No, 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 it's not. It's, uh, it's lightly populated. There's not a lot, uh, you know, a lot of folks out there. Was it Scott um, Sessions? Scott Sessions. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Moonlight view. Appreciate that. Yeah. Scott Sessions. And I did an episode on, on Scott Sessions death and I was attracted to that case because I am from New Orleans originally and I love jazz. And, um, and I found it really interesting that this guy lived, um, lived in this nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with living in North, Northern Colorado. You just don't associate jazz, <laughs> jazz, jazz musicians with that particular area. And this guy apparently was very, very gifted. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I started out that episode of body Backs talking about that, you know, as a young man walking down bourbon street and through the quarter and you could hear, uh, hear the sounds of jazz, you know, that kind of permeate the air down there mm -hmm. on, on certain nights. And, when there's not a lot of people down there and I just thought, you know, it's like throwing a, throwing a brick through a stained glass window. Um, and so that case, you know, kind of got my attention and that's one of the reasons I paid attention to it on body bags. Well, and again, body bags, massively popular podcast, uh, that the moment it started, it just shot up the, the podcast charts, if you will. And we do have links in the description for that. And uh, we will promote it everywhere because everybody should listen to you like uh, love and coco just said we're getting a master class from you and we are so lucky um 
let's talk now about Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith was a, a young man who was found in the middle of the road in 2015. They thought it was a hit and run. Uh, his mother in the very beginning pointed a finger at the Murdoch family at uh, Buster um, Murdoch and basically said he she'd heard he did it. Now, she hasn't come out and said that since then, but they just called it a hit and run and buried him. During the investigation of Alex Murdoch's murder of his wife and son, this case came back up. We don't know how. And his body was exhumed. Thank goodness it wasn't cremated. They raised enough money to get some great experts. They exhumed his body, just like Tammy Daybell's, in the morning. And then in the evening, they were able to place him back to rest. Give us what that is like, how difficult that is, kind of from beginning to end, if you could, please. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll back up many, many years first and kind of give you give you w what it was like for me the first time I ever worked on an exhumation. By the time, I, I guess I was probably two years into my career as a death investigator, and uh, I worked as a path assistant as well. So that means that at night I worked as a death investigator, and during the day I would assist with the dissections of the bodies in the morgue, best classroom in the world. It made, it made me a better death investigator. I'm not the best at death, death investigator. It made me a better death investigator though, because I could, you know, you, you begin to put together form and function. And so I was probably a year and a half, two years. I can't recall, uh, into my career as a death investigator before I ever worked in exhumation and, and they don't happen frequently. Uh, first off, there are, there are measures in place to slow the process down because if you didn't have these measures in place, everybody and their uncle would want to have a body exhumed because of some kind of unfounded suspicion. So, and judges are not commonly, um, they're not, it, it, it's not their way to just issue what's referred to as an order of exhumation. You know, you have to go before a judge and you have to demonstrate to them why there is a compelling need for this. And this is fascinating in the sense that um, with Stephen Smith, um, they were able to demonstrate this. And, and this is following, you know, most of the time when you get involved in an exhumation, many times it's on a body that has not been autopsy. Let that sink in just for a second. You hear about cases where there has been an autopsy and the body, uh, you know, will be exhumed, but those are the exception, not the norm. Most of the time is we have found some kind of other evidence years down the tracks and um, we want the body exhumed. That's the way it normally happens. So for me, um, when I first got exposed to an exhumation, it was kind of surreal it's, it's a weird thing because the casket is brought into, um, into the autopsy suite and it's placed on a separate table and, mm -hmm. you know, you document the casket, take photos, the whole nine yards. So you document the entire process. There's been some videography I've seen at Stephen Smith's when they, they broke ground out there, but, um, you, you document everything that you possibly can, because one of the, one of the big issues that you you deal with is the compromise of the remains within the casket. And it has nothing to do necessarily with vermin and that sort of thing. What you're fighting against most of the time is groundwater uh, because water tables rise and fall and particularly, you know, they don't call this area the low country for nothing. Mm -hmm. So they flood there. There are frequent floods there in that area. Um, if you have intrusion into the vault, because the body is actually inside of a, they don't just dig a hole and put a casket in the ground. If you guys pay attention when you're driving down the interstate sometimes, and you'll see these big trucks that have kind of this weird looking crane thing on the back of it. And you'll see these big concrete boxes that they're carrying. Those are vaults. They're taking them oh, out. Really? to the cemetery. Yeah. Oh, yeah okay. and you'll see them driving those. down the road. And so they'll dig the hole with a backhoe this con pre prefab concrete vault is dropped into the ground. And then, mm -hmm. so you put the casket into the vault and the concrete lid is placed on top of the vault. So the first one I was ever involved in, it was kind of surreal. It was 
uh, it was a lady. She had been down for, I think probably she had been buried for probably four to five years. Um, there had been, um, uh, there had been intrusion by water. So her body was greatly compromised. Um, there had been water like floating inside the casket. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, good Lord. Yeah. 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 And so it creates a whole, you know, a whole bevy of problems, you know, mm -hmm. when you begin to, you know, kind of assess what you're going to do, what's been left behind, what is it that you can collect? Um, there was still tissue, you know, on the body. It's not like, and you could appreciate all of her clothing that she had been buried in, all these sorts of things. You know, you jump forward a few years and I actually had uh, an African-American gentleman that was a pastor that died. Uh, and he was exhumed 15 years after the fact. And I'll never forget this as long as I live because he was buried in all white. He had a white suit a white vest, a white shirt, a white tie, white. They had white pants. Everything's white, even white patent leather shoes. The one thing that wasn't white on his body was that they had placed a red carnation in his lapel. And you could still see the petals of the carnation. Oh, wow. But the carnation had stained the suit, and there was like this blob of red right there. Yeah, yeah it was really weird. And, you know, his body was perfectly preserved. He had mold growth on one aspect of his face. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they had done a beautiful job first off for prepping him and then the embalming job, which is key. Um, and he had not been autopsied. The difference with that case in Stephen Smith is that he had been autopsied. So you're fighting, <clears throat> you're fighting a losing battle to begin with. The organs have already been removed. They may or may not be, have been buried with the body. You've already opened the body, so you've got multiple defects in the body that are post-mortem. So when you think about preservation, it doesn't really matter how much they embalm. Mm -hmm. You're still, you still have these openings, even though they seal them back up uh, like morticians do. Um, they do the best job they can, but the body's been insulted to the point post-mortem that it's, still, it's not going to be as in good a shape as the aforementioned you know, gentleman that, you know, 15 years after the fact. Um, and you know, my biggest thing with Steven Smith was since this was a motor vehicle accident, allegedly, you know, pedestrian versus a vehicle, there are just certain things that we look for, um, in the immediate, you know, when we're just working one of these things to begin with, and I'm talking about a, a fresh case, I'm not talking about a body that's been in the ground for a while, a long time. I'm talking about a, a case where, um, where we're examining the body, the main thing, the first thing you're going to look for are, well, there's two things. You're going to look for bumper marks on the body. Mm -hmm. And what that means is if somebody is standing, you don't even have to be fully erect in the middle of the road. You can kind of be bent over like you're seeing a car coming your way. And that first point of impact on your body is generally going to be somewhere in the lower body. You're going to look at, and it, it, a lot of it's dependent upon the type of vehicle. So if you think, let's just take an extreme example. Let's think about a Corvette. If you've got a Corvette, it kind of, it rides low. The profile is very low to the ground. So the bumper strike is going to be well between the knees and the ankles. Okay. Probably closer to the ankles than it would be to the knees. With um, a, a Corvette, because when the body is struck at that low, at that low point, the, the impact, the body will create this kind of, uh, it's not a fulcrum, but it, it impacts the majority of the weight's going to be up top. So the body goes into the car dependent upon where it's struck. And so like on the, it'll go into the hood of the car, like on the, well, hood of the it'll car. hit the hood and also hit the windshield. I, I don't know if you guys remember this. How many of you guys recall, and this was a horrific case. This is a few years ago. It, this case stands out to me. Do you remember the lady that hit the man on the way home and left him in the windshield and parked her car in the garage? Well, he was still alive. Oh, he was yeah. still alive. Yeah. And that was, and you know, and I, that's kind of a classic kind of event where you have a bumper strike, the body is driven into the windshield and I've had them where they're hit low. They hit, they'll impact the windshield with like a shoulder and then fly over the roof too. 
Then you have higher profile vehicles. When you start to get up into uh, higher profile sedans, perhaps certainly trucks, there is, um, you're still going to get hit. It'll be higher up on the body, but you, you run the potential for what are called rollover injuries. So mm -hmm. everybody just close your eyes and think about what a tumble dryer looks like. If you can see in the little window and you see the clothes kind of rolling around in there as they're being dried, the body will enter beneath the car like this and the car will roll over. So you'll see the, the, Clothing will be stained with grease, stuff from the undercarriage. If you've ever changed your oil or checked your oil in your car, ran your hand underneath the undercarriage, try to change a tire. You can't get away without getting some kind of schmutz on your hand. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that same schmutz transfers to the body, and you'll see all kinds of staining on the clothing. Clothing will be twisted and, um, and torn. Um, there'll be tire tread marks on the clothing all of that sort of thing. Then the body is kind of spewed out of the rear of the car bumps and goes on down the road. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you've got grill strikes with a truck. It's got to initially make that impact. So if you live somewhere where there's a lot of pickup trucks, I live in Alabama, so we've got a bumper crop. Yes. Um, and if you have, take it to extreme, you have a lift kit on the truck. The point of impact is, you know, you know, hello grill, you know, you get hit by the grill. Right I've, I've yeah. had, I've had people that have had grill marks on their face. I've actually had emblems from vehicles. I had one guy that had a partial Chevrolet symbol on the side of his face oh, years ago. Oh. So, you know, you'll get a lot of evidence that's left behind just from that initial impact of that mm -hmm. vehicle striking the body. So in the fresh dead, that's what we're looking for. You know, we want to know, um, those initial points of contact, if your opinion at the scene or if you're being told by investigators at the scene that this is a pedestrian versus versus car, okay, it's very definitive. And this would stand out. Now, I don't know about you guys. Have you guys seen the pictures of Stephen's clothing that was released? They're floating around on the Internet. I know. haven't. We'll see if we can find them and put them up. Yeah. Um, and th those were, those images were taken, I think at the morgue, it looks like they were because they're like laid out on a yellow tarp and mm -hmm. you've got these images guys, none of these clothing, none of this clothing looks like it's been beneath the undercarriage of a vehicle. Okay. It, it doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that he it. was not struck by a vehicle. I'm just saying right. you can kind of check off the list that there's anything on the clothing at least that was consistent with rollover because the clothing doesn't appear to be torn in mm -hmm. any way. It, it ripped because you get this, this kind of torsion injury that or insult to the clothing where the fabric just rips. You think about how fast car tires are spinning that mm -hmm. dynamic. And not to mention if the body gets hung beneath the car, it's going to rip the clothing will rip that way too. Right. You'll see, you'll see all of this is kind of just really disheveled the images that I saw. If those in fact are real images, it just did not appear to me. And the images of the clothing that I saw from, um, the images that I saw of the clothing mm -hmm. that were laid out, this is after the clothing been taken off. That's one of the things we do at the morgue married up with the images that were released from the scene. They actually had scene photographs that I've seen of Steven at the scene in the middle of the road. That clothing looked the same as the images from the clothing I saw at the morgue. Okay. If anybody has that picture, if you could email or text it to me, I've just gone online and I, I can't seem to find it, but I'm sure it's out there somewhere. So we could put that up. So obviously it didn't look like he was hit by a car at all. Right? Well, just based on the clothing alone, um, if you were, okay, let's say I didn't know anything about Stephen Smith, which okay. I don't really know any more than you guys know. All right. right. <clears throat> and you just, you presented me with his clothing and said, all right, Morgan, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing my mind is going to flee to is I'm not going to say, well, geez, this looks like clothing that came off somebody that was a pedestrian that was struck by a vehicle. 
That's okay. not where my mind is going to go to. I might right. look, for, you might be, I might think you're saying, well, look for evidence of blood deposition or something like that. Mm -hmm. I might look for that sort of thing. Um, I, I guess, I guess one of my big questions, obviously there are questions about his remains. Yes. You know, they're doing the exhumation or have done the exhumation. My big question is what's the status of the clothing? Mm -hmm. First off, I'm very surprised that they've allowed an independent team to do the exhumation. And I think that, so that, why, does that why does that surprise you? Because this is an open homicide investigation. And that okay. body has evidentiary value. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the tail of the tape will be this. If they, if they have that clothing, if they will allow the family to have clothing, have an independent criminalist take a look at it. Okay. My understanding is I have heard snatches. I haven't been able to verify it. And I can't remember where it came from. Maybe it was from the autopsy report. I, uh, I get confused after a while. But um, allegedly there were some paint chips that were found on the clothing. And I, if I remember, I think the color was blue. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that's one of the things we look for you know, on clothing, We're, we try to be very careful with it at the morgue. You don't cut it off if possible. Right. You try to, you know, disrobe the person just like they're in life and be mm -hmm. very, very careful. It generally takes, it's best to have two people like remove the shirt and the pants together and you're moving in tandem. Just think of it. Um, my wife has, has these, these, uh, <laughs> we laugh. I, I look, I roll my eyes every time. Um, and she's got these, uh, uh, it's like a, uh, I don't know. You guys are going to know that I'm such an ignorant. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that you, it's, it's one of these, it looks like a giant pillowcase for your bedspread. You know, you're talking the, about a, not a sham or a, yeah, not, yeah. Not yeah. A you know, and then you have to zip the thing up inside the bedspread inside of it. It I takes both. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. It, it takes both of us to facilitate this. And I just take, I take, I take direction from her. Okay. I do what I'm told. And so, and so it's, it's one of these things where when you're removing clothing off of the bed like this, and you're trying to be really, really careful, mm -hmm. the first thing you want to do is lay the body onto a clean white sheet on the autopsy table. And then, you know, you place, you lay the, you lay the, cl the clean white sheet. Mm -hmm. and then you lay the body on top of it. And that way, if any trace evidence falls away from it, you'll capture it. Hopefully, before you've ever removed the clothing from the body, you've already done things like tape lifts and searches for fibers and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But my big question is, are they still in possession of the clothing? Uh, are they going to at least have another, uh, have another separate, forensic scientists take a look at the clothing hell get it to the fbi i mean why not i mean what what do you got to lose you know get it see if you can get the fbi to take an interest in this case and i would think with with as much fanfare has been involved surrounding mm -hmm. all of these cases down there in the low country that you might get the attention of the fbi you know ask for their assistance in this um, and say, look, do you guys mind taking this to Quantico, have a separate look at it, get a new set of eyes on it, maybe apply some of your technology to it, to get an idea right. as to what you might think. <clears throat> Heels in there. Um, <laughs> I know I, the name shocks you, but there's, it, a, and I it, know what everybody, what they think when you first hear it, it's a takeoff on some really bad YouTubers called Heels on the Ground. Oh, and, okay. All right. And, yeah. Okay. And Heels in the Air <laughs> exposes these people in a very humorous way on on her YouTube channel. Okay. So, All right. yeah, well, I should I'll, explain I'll have to that. check that out. Yeah, it's uh, great. <laughs> it just popped, it popped up on my screen. Uh, <laughs> so high Heels in the Air. Anyway, <laughs> I get, I'm shocked by it every time I see it. I anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I see that, that Marlene is mentioning uh, in chat that uh, – that Steven's shoes were still on. And that's, that's one of the things that's often stated um, that when people are hit with such ferocity by a vehicle mm -hmm. um, that uh, many times they are literally knocked out of their shoes. It doesn't happen every time, uh, but it happens more frequently with like athletic shoes than it say 
for instance, work boots. You know, if you have mm-hmm. somebody that's wearing lace up work boots, it's not going to happen. Um, but here's, here's another piece to this is that, um, um, some people have talked about, um, have talked about the fact that, um, that he was found in the middle of the road. And the image is clearly, I mean, he's laying on the center line, it looks mm-hmm. like. I mean, when you see, when you guys finally see the images that I'm referring to, you'll see what I'm talking about. Well, I think that the original forensic pathologist opined that to them, this appeared to be a, a mirror strike, which means that commonly the individual will be oriented on the side of the road. You know, they're maybe thumbing for a ride or their attention is drawn away and they suddenly turn around they see a car coming they don't get out of the way and the mirror clips them well he's got a lot of damage to his body for a mirror strike i mean we're talking about massive head injury remember the emts initially upon arrival said this looks like a gunshot wound um and then you've got a dislocated shoulder and you've got trauma to the hands but beyond that there's not there's not a lot of other um not a lot of other trauma to this mm-hmm. point that I've heard about. Um, I'm hoping that wherever they did this autopsy, this this follow-up examination, uh, my biggest concern about this is uh, do they have access to um, the latest imaging equipment and um, because there's a lot of stuff that can be missed, um, at minimum, Steven's body needed to be x-rayed from, uh, from head to toe, both in the AP, which means straight on, then rolled onto his side and x-rayed laterally from head to toe. You know, kind of like when we go to a doctor's office, you know, when we go to a doctor's office and they tell us to you know, they take you into the little room where they're going to do x-rays and they tell you to, you know, put your chin on the board like that, you know, and you have to roll your shoulders forward and you stand there and they, they do the x-ray. They're doing the chest x-ray of you. And then they tell you to stand in profile. Well, it's the same principle that's applied with the dead. And so, um, you want to, you want to assure that, that you cover everything because you can miss hairline fractures. I want to know, if there was kind of any other uh, um, skeletal anatomy that was compromised in this being struck by a vehicle, and if you can, if you can get an idea for that regarding the anatomical location, it will it will give you more of a uh, of an understanding of the relationship between Stephen and the car that struck him. You know, the physical like what position was he in? Uh, was he down on the ground? Was he standing fully erect? Was he squatted? Was he standing, um, standing in profile when he was struck or was he standing head on when he struck? Was he standing to the side? If it's a mirror strike, how do you wind up in the middle of the road? I think that's, that was a, that's a question that should be asked and answered. Um, because you know, when I heard, when I saw it, because I hadn't seen the photos until just a few days ago. So when I started to try to, um, marry this up in my mind relative to this idea of a mirror strike that's floating around, and then I see him in the middle of the road. I'm thinking these two things don't job, you know, to me, they just don't. So, um, who knows, who knows, but I, I do know that we're dealing with blunt force trauma. I just, you don't know what the source of that blunt force trauma is. That can be anything. I had muted myself. Sorry. Uh, one of the things that Stephen's mother suggested was that it was from a baseball bat that she had gotten information that they were out hitting mailboxes like young kids do, and uh, that he was hit with a baseball bat. I'm certainly no expert. The little bit you've described, could that? really be a possibility it sounds like it it all depends on how extensive the trauma is to the head Mm -hmm. okay because yeah i mean it's possible certainly um just normal velocity of us swinging a baseball bat Mm -hmm. um if 
if yeah. if you're talking about the swinging of a baseball bat with the without the added uh uh yeah miss hayes i i agree with you uh yeah that's possible it could have been if it was a mere strike he may have been walking in the middle of the road that is possible um nothing can be discounted but just if we're standing here static and someone swings a baseball bat and they strike somebody in the head okay that can kill them all right however if you're passing by in a car and you're swinging a baseball bat out of a passenger window you're playing uh mailbox baseball i think they used to call it matter of fact if you've ever seen the movie uh what is it uh Oh Lord have mercy. Uh with uh it's based on the Stephen King uh novella uh with uh uh River Phoenix and uh uh Stand by me. Stand by me. They're mm -hmm. the guys are playing uh mailbox baseball in that yes. movie, and you'll see what I'm talking about. That's a single strike though, as you're going by. And if the trauma is extensive as they say it is, again, I don't know what that assessment means um how far ranging are these fractures because you know you can actually hit somebody with a baseball bat and it's going to be focally located and you'll get a central fracture in that location let's just say i'm standing on the side of the road somebody drives by and hits me in the side of the head with a baseball bat well stands to reason my fracture is going to be here but if i've got a fracture that ranges that spider webs out and goes over here and goes over here and i've got something in the back i need a baseball bat or it's not a single blow from a baseball bat. You see what I'm saying? So yes, absolutely. You, it, it's a very dynamic thing. Um, and again, at that particular time, you know, if you've got this kind of head trauma, what would have needed to have happened, um, and I hope that they did it, is his head would have should have been completely shaved. Mm -hmm. Completely shaved. If you're talking about blunt force trauma, well, any kind of blunt force trauma, you want to be able to appreciate um, the markings um, that are there. I'll give you an example. Um, if you're struck inside the head with a mirror, let's use the mirror, and it's one of these, let's say it's a, a King Ranch 250 Ford that's kind of elevated. You're standing there and you get struck in the side of the head with this mirror. Well, that mirror has got margins all the way around it, and it's got little perhaps it's not completely smooth it's going to have little undulations on it the way the thing is is made um it will leave a definite contused area on that point of impact and mm -hmm. you cannot fully appreciate that if you're trying to visualize it through hair so what we'll do most of the time is take the leading edge of a scalpel and we'll shave shave the hair away and you want a photograph of that because it's going to be it's not going to be quantitatively matchable in court, you know, but you can qualify it. You know, they can ask a forensic pathologist, in your opinion, doc, does the injury on the side of the head here, does this marry up with an object like this? And they put a picture of the suspected mirror that may have done the strike. Yeah, you can see the margins right here. I've annotated it in my report. We've got pictures of it here. And then the jury can draw their own conclusions there. Baseball bats leave specific marks from a contusion standpoint. It's a weird thing when you see um, there's a great old, old newsreel. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it <clears throat> from the 30s where this guy used to catch cannonballs. Have you ever seen that? And it's, it's in slow motion. It's in black and white. He's kind of a pudgy guy. And they fire a cannon at him. <laughs> so cannon, now, yeah, and it's in cannon, it and, and you see yeah. the ripples go through his body. Well, that's blunt force trauma. And what happens is, is that when you're met with that energy of that object coming at you, what happens is, even if you've got a flat, a flat tummy, the energy of that object striking you your tissue is going to actually wrap around just for a millisecond around that object. It happens the same way with a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. So when you're struck, when you're struck with a baseball bat, an object like that, 
and the body receives that energy, it will, the tissue will actually wrap around the sides of the bat and you'll get these weird looking little margins that run parallel to one another. And a lot of that is dependent upon where you're struck on the, on the skull. If you're, or on the side of the face or wherever, you know, if you're on the top of the head, it's going to be a little bit harder to read because there's not as much give up there. You know, there's not a lot of tissue between, we don't have a big layer of fat between our scalp and the external table of our skull. Down here, it's a bit more fleshy on the sides, that sort of thing. You might be able to read it a little bit better, but there'll be some kind of markings that are left behind. Right. We do have a question and it comes from uh, Kim Bissett says, uh, wouldn't whomever was holding that bat have fractured or uh, break from that kind of, wouldn't it fracture or break from that kind of impact? If they're motoring along down the road in a car and they swing it. Right. Is that what you're saying? Would yeah, the, yeah, I think that's what they're saying. Yes. Yeah. I, I suppose possibly. Um, I know, I know I've, I've swung and hit a baseball before um, and I felt it up my arms mm -hmm. when I did it. Um, and if you increase velocity, it's not just you swinging the bat. It's actually, you've got added velocity of hanging out of the window of a moving vehicle that, you know, where they're swinging. But again, I'd have to ask this question. Um, how many mailboxes have been wrecked up and down that road? Do they have a history of that? Is that something that happened immediately adjacent to that same time? Yeah, and couldn't they I'm asking that question legitimately. Right. I don't know. Couldn't they and tell that, that date if there were just a bunch of mailboxes reported bashed? That would be helpful. Oh, it, it, yeah, and there's there's great distances between these homes out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just like all over the rural south, you know, there's you don't have like an immediate next door neighbor in a lot of these locations, which for me is fun by me. I like that living. Yes. You know, some it's not exactly. for some people, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. But you know. Um, you would still be able to, and there's going to be in, in an area like this, if you're getting your mailbox bashed, trust me, the police are going to receive phone calls. <laughs> people don't want their mailboxes bashed. I'm sure that people in, in our audience tonight have had their mailboxes bashed and destroyed mm -hmm. and all those sorts of things. It's not cool, man. And so people would have complained about this. So I wonder if there's a history of that in this area. It sounds like something that a bunch of kids might do or could do. Um, and I don't know if it's specifically, I think people have floated around the idea of a baseball bat, but I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully the autopsy or the second examination would, would reveal something like that if it's there. The question is, um, how good a condition are Stevens remains in? I think that's, that's one of the big questions here. And can they actually appreciate that, um, you know, appreciate that? Uh, all these years later, because we're um, we're eight years downrange at this point. Uh, why do you think they so quickly just said, oh, this is a hit and run? Because everything that we've been talking about here that you've been talking about is a very good reason to pause. And oh, of course it is. To, but I mean, what do you think just working with police and kind of knowing how this whole system work works, maybe not in that area, but you know, in general, why do you think they just went up oh, hit and run? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we have used that term, um, um, hit and run quite a bit. Let's, let's change our vernacular a little bit. This is an open homicide. It always has been an open homicide because we know that, Stephen didn't die as a result of a heart attack. He didn't die as a result of a stroke. Um, this is trauma related and there's nobody that has stepped forward and offered up and has stated plainly that, that they did this. There should have been an ongoing investigation looking for, um, what person or persons perpetrated this. Make no mistake, this this has always been a homicide investigation. It just, I don't know if it fell through the cracks or if it was just something that, you know, they lost the will on or maybe the trail got, went cold. I, I wouldn't think that in a, um, we've already stated pretty clearly that this is a lightly populated area. How many of these other cases do you have going on down there that you're so overwhelmed that you can't focus on this case? 
And Good I, question. Um, Good you know, question. I'm, I'm just wondering, do you have, are, are you working hundreds of hit and run cases? Mm-hmm. You know, like if you lived in Dallas or if you, you know, lived in Atlanta, even Atlanta and Dallas don't have hundreds of hit and run cases that have wound up in fatalities that have resulted right. in fatalities that are unsolved. Um, um, I, I think, um, I, I think that one of the questions is, is that, um, you know, what, what else was, was so important that this case kind of fell through the cracks, if you will. Exactly. And it really did. It was just put on the back burner and nothing was done. And I can't imagine Stephen's mother, but uh, thank you, Sarah Allen Humboldt. And I want to thank uh, as well, another member wildfire for becoming a new member. And thank you for the super chat. Sarah Allen says, uh, Joe Scott, do you think that evil has been winning the war between good and evil, or does it just seem so? It seems so. I think it's amplified by virtue of the world that we live in now. Um, uh, and I can only say this from, I, I do. Well, I, I, let me, let me rephrase. I think that there is an increase in the level of violence that, that I'm witnessing at this point. Uh, I think that there is, um, there's potentially a more robust thread of evil, but I can, I'm not really the person to ask that question of because my lens is so cracked. I've been covering this and working in this for 40 years, if not longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think 40 years when you combine my experience as an investigator, which was a 20 year career doing nothing but death investigation. I've always seen evil everywhere I've gone or the result of evil. I didn't bear witness uh, to, to the act itself, but always bore witness to the product of the act. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it certainly seems amplified. I'll give you that. And it, it does seem, seem many times, um, like, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, actually one of my colleagues at university, I was saying some days I feel like I'm, I'm Tarzan, I'm swinging vine to vine. I'm going from one horrible case to the next. Um, and I'm not complaining because it's what I signed up to do. It's what I right. do. But what I'm saying is, is that I keep waiting for the next thing to happen and it always does happen. And it's just going to take a different shape. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's a mass shooting or if it's a Chris Watts or whether it's an Idaho or, you know, whatever the case might be, it is, it is certainly, um, um, it, it, it is certainly amplified. I I have to say that in in my, in my experience, I, I tell you what, I'll put it to you this way. I tell my kids all the time in class, I'm glad I'm teaching you and I'm glad I'm not going to be your colleague. I'm glad that, I've got a wife that's retiring literally in 30 days from public education after all these years. And wonderful, you know, I get to enjoy my wife, be at home with my family, go and teach and then come Mm -hmm. home. I don't have to spend nights out on the streets any longer because I would not want to operate in the world that we operate in now. There's just, there's no way as a practitioner. And I see it, I see it four times. Um, um, I see it, four times a year because I teach at the police academy four times a year as well. And I walk in and I see, you know, I'll have a hundred police cadets in each one of these classes that I teach. And I'll look out over there and I think, first off, was I ever that young? And secondly, it's like, it's like I want to rush out, grab them by the shoulders and say, have you considered any other occupation? It's exactly because they're going to have a, a hell of a time at times, which brings me to this question that we posted in the chat from retired RN. Joseph Scott Morgan, how do you keep from becoming burnt out and overwhelmed? I focus on the science. I focus on, and it's a lot easier for me to focus on the science in this format that I do now um, than it, than it was as I had a lot of burnout and you know, you guys that read blood beneath my feet know the price that, that I paid. Um, I, I'm, it's very revealing relative to my personal life and the stuff that, that uh, I put myself through. It was my responsibility. Um, now I can look at it through more of a, um, now I can look at it through, um, a different lens, uh, more of a clinical lens. Uh, I can be more clinical about it than I ever was when, um, when I was out in the field, cause it's not embroidered by 
the screams of family members and, you know, all of those sorts of things that you have to bear witness to on a daily basis. You know, I'm, I communicate people with people this way. And then occasionally I'll go out and do television shows and all that sort of stuff. So I have a distance from it now. Uh, a couple of quick questions and I am going to show you some of the pictures of Stephen Smith. If you could comment on them uh, real quickly. Uh, Gambler, one of our, our good members here, uh, well, you're all good members, is asking if they took anal swabs and if that's typical in a hit and run. That's a good question. No, it's not. It's not. Um, I think um, I think that, that that was, I'm glad that they did it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I truly am. Um, I don't know if they saw something that was provocative from an investigative standpoint, I don't know if they knew something um, about Stephen that would prompt them to do that at that particular time. Um, he was fully clothed from the images that I saw. It's not like his, uh, he was in a, a, a state of undress, you know, um, most of the time when, you know, I know that we handle, um, uh, sexual assault or suspected sexual assault, uh, cases in, in death investigation, you know, you're going to get a rape kit. I mean, um, you know, and when they're saying, when they're saying they did swabs, it, you can't just do swabs, um, with a kit like this, first off, you're going to be a laughing stock if you only do swabs because you have to do the full the full court press, you're going to do fingernail scrapings, clippings. You're going to do hair pluckings, pubic hair pluckings. Um, you'll do head hair, uh, pluckings. Um, you'll do everything because, you know, if you go on the stand and you say, well, yeah, I did anal swaps. Okay. Why? Uh, we suspected we wanted to rule in or rule out potential sexual assault. Okay. Well, what did you find when you did the nail scrapings? Oh, we didn't do no scrapings. Why not? You did it. You did anal swabs. Uh, I, um, I don't know. I don't know why we didn't do it. Um, we just decided not to do it. You can't do that. You, if you, you know, see, um, every scene, every time. So if you apply that standard every single time, you're not going to run into trouble. But when you start doing things in, um, in a, I'll keep it clean in a halfway manner, um, you know, then that's going to come back to bite you in court. And from a scientific standpoint, for anybody that I have that's in uh, medical practice out there um, or that's a working scientist, you know that you, you know, you apply the same standard every single time. If not, then what you're doing is going to be invalidated. It's the same thing. It's only now what you're doing is going to have to go before a court of law and you have to explain that. Right. So I think that we're, hopefully we're just missing part of the story here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully when they say that they're doing these swabs, oh, by the way, we also did nail scrapings. We also did nail clippings because if you've got a sexual assault that's going on, then perhaps there was a fight. If there was a fight, that means you've got scratching, you've got clawing, you've got hair pulling, you've got all kinds of stuff that goes on. You get transfer of evidence onto the pads of the hands any number of things can happen. It's not, you're not just going to find evidence in the anal rectal area. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that, um, I, I think that that would be, you know, certainly a question that should be asked and answered. Hopefully, um, hopefully positively. Right. Uh, the Thoris, we'll get to your question here shortly because we have pictures now from the New York post of Steven's body. Um, <laughs> Joe, are you able to see my screen? I see you. Okay, that's that's all you need to do. Let me share these, and then you can uh, just give us, and then we'll get to the Thoris question here. Um, oops, wrong one. Let's see, where is it? There it is. Hold on, just a second. Sorry, this is. I am so technically challenged; it's just disgusting. So let me close this, and we'll do it one more set time here. There we go. <clears throat> Uh, okay. Can you see this one? It's kind of blurred. 
Yeah, yeah. Th these are the same images. I think I was on News Nation the other night. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I was on Court TV with Vinny. And I don't know if you guys ever watched Vinny Politan, but oh, he and absolutely. I, he, Vinny and I, uh, we were doing every Wednesday night together, but I'm generally on like two or three nights a week with him. These are the same images that I saw. And as I mentioned earlier, this is what I was recalling. Um, he's lying in the mid, in, in the midline of the road. He's on the, the, uh, the central line of the road, which is an interesting position to be in if, if, given the nature of what you're talking about with a mirror strike. Uh, not to say that a mirror strike couldn't happen. One of our um, <laughs> insightful uh, guests was making a comment. He could have been walking in the middle of the road, and you're absolutely right. A person could have attempted to dodge him. But here's another thing if we're talking about mirror strikes. Um, when you look at this image of him, and there he is with his shoes. See, his shoes are still on him. He's wearing shorts. And he's got this dark shirt on. And the, the shirt, you can see right, I'm pointing at the screen like you guys can see me pointing. Uh, there's like a little bit of piping, like white piping that runs up. If you look uh, on the right, on Stephen's right side, there's piping that runs throughout. The, and I, I don't know if that's reflective or not, um, but I saw the piping in the autopsy images as well. Um, if... One of the things that we'd look for in a in a pedestrian strike is what's referred to as a uh, a debris field. Uh, uh, most cars nowadays are crap, all right, and most of them, many of them, are made out of molded plastic, fiberglass, whatever composition they have. You're going to have some kind of breakage that's going to take place. Um, you know, if you're struck head on. Lens caps in particular or lens covers on headlights are very fragile. They'll shatter many times and you'll see that line about, uh, you'll see other bits of debris, fractured plastic. You might see molding from the car. Uh, mirrors are not very resilient. Uh, mirrors break off very easily. Uh, for some reason, I keep having an image of a Ford Taurus car when I think about a molded mirror, if you've ever seen a Ford Taurus and the side view mirrors on those things are literally molded into the side of the car. I think about that and how easily one of those would shatter and come apart. <clears throat> Other thing that you're absent. And again, this is a very limited image that I'm looking at. Um, there are no tire marks here. It doesn't look like anybody's hit the brakes. And I, again, I have to qualify that by saying I'm not seeing the full picture. Because, you know, when, when we take, if you'll pull back, Trish, if you could go back, there's a daylight image of, uh, of a, um, uh, of a, it looked like a trooper, uh, walking down the roadway and it's fully illuminated. And I, th and, and I think that orange square denotes, yeah, that orange square right in the center right there, that's, that denotes where his body was. So they actually drew that out in paint right there to indicate where he was. I'm looking at this, this surface here and I got to tell you, I, uh, I don't see, I don't see brake marks anywhere, uh, in here. Like somebody hit the brakes as if they were attempting to, you know, dodge or avoid or any of these things. You look at the left shoulder of the road. That's actually a, um, uh, I think that that is a South Carolina state trooper there that's to the left. That looks like their uniform. <clears throat> I don't see any evidence that anybody's run off the road over there. Like, you know, that's very robust, thick grass. If anything had insulted that area, like uh, a car traveling at high speed that kind of whipped off the road and went back on, you'd see evidence in that, um, in kind of in that immediate area. It would have kind of arced around. I don't really see that either. So there's, there's, more, there's more things that are absent than are present. And uh, I was just having this discussion in class today with, with my, my students. Uh, we were actually covering, uh, I'm doing a lecture right now on uh, cases, uh, deaths resulting from abuse and neglect. It's my least favorite um, lecture to give, but um, we're, one of the things we always hearken back to in class is that, um, is that um, negative findings are just, as, are just as important as positive findings in forensics. 
because if we have negative findings that can that can send us in an, another direction it can take us take us somewhere else you know if we're considering all the possibilities relative to uh, what we're considering in a death investigation so if i'm if i've got a young man lying in the middle of the road there's no de- let's just kind of check the boxes real quick we've got a young man lying in the middle of the road uh, his clothing is intact. He's wearing his shoes. There's no debris field. There's no tire marks. Um, and, um, there's no evidence of rollover injuries. Then logic would dictate that that would send us in a different direction. Now I can't really speak to anything else beyond that, you know, and then when you get him to the morgue, uh, now you now you're doing rape kits. You're doing rape kits now. And, uh, you're saying that this was a bumper, I mean, a, a mirror strike. Um, what's taking you down this road? Because as a scientist, you have to ask that question. You know, if somebody else has been involved in an experiment or an examination, you'll say, okay, what was the prompt here? Um, do you, do you, I mean, it's kind of an odd sounding question, but right. do you do, do you do, rape kits on every single hit and run case that you it's work. It's so bizarre. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a question that, that I would ask, you know, and I would want that explained to me. If it wasn't explained to me, then I'd say, okay, well, maybe you don't have the capacity to explain it or you don't want to explain it, mm-hmm. but it's a question that should be asked. And I'm sure that some bright bulb in the media has been asking that question. Any reporter that has an opportunity to catch the ear of the people that were involved in that initial investigation would say, well, what? Why'd you do a rape kit or why'd you do these swabs? Uh, right. I don't understand. And, and the answer, the answer, the, the answer to that question, we're just trying to be thorough. is not a sufficient answer. That's insufficient. No, Cause it's, it's a weird thing to do. I, I have a couple of, of thank yous that I want to give here. Uh, first of all, wildfire. Thank you so much <laughs> for your super sticker and Mike, thank you for your super sticker, my dear as well as uh, Jeannie Phipps. Thank you is now a YouTube member. We really do appreciate that. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I do want to get to a, a question that it's off it's off the Stephen Smith topic. And then uh, we'll, we'll let you go, uh, Joe, because I know you're exhausted and uh, people in chat have been commenting that they're worried about you working too hard. So <laughs> we'll, we'll idle you. hands are the devil's workshop. I'll try to okay. stay busy. Perfect. <laughs> okay. The Thoris wants to know, Mr. Morgan, was there ever a case you investigated that had twists and turns that ended up being completely one that shocked you and the other investigators? Uh, let's see a case that had twists and turns that shocked me. Um, uh, Uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess probably, uh, probably it had to be, um, there, there's a couple of them that were quite horrific, um, that, you know, stand out in my mind that I think they didn't so much have twists and turns as they did, um, the the cases themselves were you know they shocked my senses that you didn't expect to see this kind of reaction out of a human being um um i had a had a lady that impaled her baby on a bedpost and uh when i began to question her she just began laughing maniacally at me and i felt like i was in the presence of evil you asked about evil a little while ago uh that was many years ago that stands out um, let's see, I had, uh, I had one case where I had a, a, a deacon in a Baptist church that had, uh, left the church, renounced Christianity and was involved with a group down in New Orleans. And we got called to his house. It was a suicide. And he had an entire room that was filled with lit black candles. And he had drawn a huge pentagram in the middle of the floor. And he blew his brains out with a shotgun and he had written a note, um, to whom it may concern. This is, uh, um, I've just sacrificed myself to Satan. Um, that, you know, those kinds of things, uh, because, you know, we, 
in, in my little world that I worked as an investigator in New Orleans and Atlanta, we would have really bizarre cases. And I saw a lot of bizarre things, but there were not a lot of um, kind of, there were whodunits, but it's not in a whodunit way that you might like an Agatha Christie kind of whodunit. Uh, nothing quite that intellectually stimulating. Um, those cases rise to the top now in the world that I kind of inhabit now because you have such a wide selection of cases that come in because I don't, I'm not, I'm not just doing cases in my little, you know, corner of the world. I'm doing cases from all over the country and I've been handling cases from, um, um, you know, all over the world now. Um, I just taped one the other day, uh, a body bags case. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, this gal in the news that <coughs> her and her boyfriend were into, and this was out of England. They were into quote unquote, they lived the BDM BD. I never can get these acronyms correct. BDSM lifestyle. And they were into knife play and she had, stabbed him multiple times and she just wanted to know what it was like to stab somebody. And when you uh, see the interior of her house, it's, it's festooned with, with images of serial killers from all over the world. And I'm thinking she's inhabiting this space and she's got an eight year old child that lives there with her too. And so there's like these sketch drawings of like Ted Bundy, the acid bath murders. If you're familiar with those cases out of great Britain who, you know, they talk about those cases a lot. Um, there was an image of one of the prostitutes that, um, Jack the Ripper had killed. Um, she had a, a sketch rendering of, uh, of, uh, Richard Ramirez holding up his hand with a pentagram on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you see a lot of those cases now, uh, in, I do that are more whodunits or more salacious or greatly varied, um, because of, uh, the variety as far as twist go, I, I think, um, my not saying twist, I think for me, probably, um, uh, dissatisfied because, um, there were, I was involved in three separate serial homicide investigations, three separate perpetrators that I knew of. And, uh, two of those series were still ongoing, uh, when, when I left, um, they had not stopped killing to the best of, of what we could figure out mm-hmm. at that point in time to this day, they might be solved now, but you know, um, you know, and that, that's very dissatisfying, you know, uh, but you know, I'm on the medical legal end. So it's not like I'm out searching for doing profiles and looking for, uh, for people that are out there continuing to kill. I just try to figure out what's in front of me. And, you know, I think that that's an important part of what we do as investigators. Joseph Scott Morgan, we could keep you all night long, and one day we will because you're too polite to say you got to go. So, um, we, but tonight I will let you go. Um, okay. Red Like Wine Again basically says what we're all thinking and we want to say. We really appreciate you taking the time to come here and patiently explain things to us. This information well, th- is invaluable. Well, well, thank you guys. Uh, you guys are are um, some of my favorite folks to talk to. Oh, I, I love hanging out with you guys. You're always so generous. And and I thank y'all. Y'all please uh, give a listen to Body Bags. Uh, I'm also involved in other podcasts that I appear that are pretty doing pretty well right now. Uh, we just had, I work with KT Studios quite a bit. Mm-hmm. They're not affiliated with Body Bags, but I, I do the Piketon Massacre, if you're familiar with the Piketon Massacre. We'll, we'll find that and link yeah, it. Yeah, yes, and that's, that's the the octuple homicide that occurred in one night in four separate locations in Ohio, in Ohio uh, where right. to the second, the second trial is coming up mm-hmm. and covering it. Uh, just premiered a new podcast called death Island that takes mm-hmm. place in, um, in, uh, down in, the, um, the South Pacific, check that one out. And there, there's several other ones that I've been involved in and it's been great practice for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, anytime I can get on air or chat with people, it helps me be a better presenter. So I look forward to those opportunities, but please, 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 I beg you, please listen to body bags and please give me a review on if you're an Apple person, I'm an Android person, but if you listen on Apple, 
Apple's the only place where you can really give reviews, and that helps me so much. So please give me a rating and a review. It would be greatly appreciated. But I'm on all platforms, I, um, iHeart, uh, Spotify, and Apple, and Stitcher, and all that stuff that's out there. Uh, Audible, we're, we're on Audible. So uh, yes. thank you, guys. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you, Diana. Oh, thanking Joseph Scott Morgan for your time and for that super chat, Diana. Oh, thank you. You take care, my dear. And the link to body bags is in the description and we'll get the link to the other ones that you mentioned as well. Okay. Y'all take care. Have a good evening. It might be safe out there. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. You you. Right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. And I want to thank Emily Narb for sending me uh, the picture and Maria M for emailing me the New York Post with the pictures. Thank you both so much. That was a big, big help. Don't you just love this man? I mean, I just yeah. adore him. He is the absolute best. I uh, hope I didn't miss any uh, super chat donations here tonight. I really do. So uh, if I did, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. But real quick, I want to mention and thank you, uh, JDR, for sending this to me earlier. And I've had a couple of people send it to me. The uh, creator of Cash App, one of the applications we use for donations, was stabbed in San Francisco, like in the middle of the night, murdered. And yeah. uh, last I heard, now I haven't read anything except for what I read this morning, was they didn't have any suspects or anything. I don't know if that's still true or not. But, oh man, just shows you, you can have all kinds of money in the world and true crime evil people can still get at you. I don't know what he was doing out that late. I've been out that late doing nothing nefarious. You know, sometimes you just can't sleep. Right. And you, you get out for a walk. So, so who knows? So anyway, yes, Lindy Bridges, he is absolutely fantastic. And I want to say it's great to see the weird mom. I haven't seen you for so long. I was worried about you. So it is very good to see you, my dear. And um, okay, you know, we've got Oh my gosh, it is so late already. And I am so old, people. I am so old. Um, there are so many things I wanted to do. I wanted to play, and thank you for grabbing this uh, insightful one. I wanted to play the BTK uh, uh, allocution so you can understand what Joseph Scott Morgan was talking about. You know, what's tomorrow? Thursday? We don't have any guests or anything, right? Yeah, we can do it tomorrow. Okay, we can do it tomorrow. Tomorrow, I want to tell you about what happened to me today. Um, I went on a um, you, live YouTube. I, I didn't know this person, but they had Don Wells on there. And I was able to get on there and apologize to Don for um, believing in Chris Madonna. And we talked for a little bit. So that was that was all good. I was very happy to do that. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, don't forget, I've got I'll put the links in the description. Nate Eaton has a great YouTube tonight about jury selection continuing for uh, Lori Day, Lori Vallow Daybell. And at the end of his YouTube, he has a surprise announcement and he's really excited about it. So I'll, I'll link that. I want you to go watch it. We'll also put up links to law and crime to Letitia's trial today as well. And then I even have like a woo woo story to tell you, but I can save that for Saturday night. So, okay. Is there anything else, my darling? I know we were going to get to these other things, but again, I'm just so old. I, I need my rest. <laughs> I need my rest. No, tomorrow would be good since we don't have nothing going on so far. Yeah. So we can just chit chat and just be two chicks chit chatting. And I want to yeah. say hi to Allison and Facebook land. Thank you for always sticking with us. And uh, maybe someday we'll get you into chat. Okay. I need to go visit with my sweet, adorable son who got home. Right. Which I was starting this at a lodge in my mouth. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go do that. Thank you, Moonlight View, for everything. And thank you so much, Love and Coco. I didn't see Ping tonight. I'm sure he's fine, everybody. I will check in with him. Don't forget Sunday nights, 930 Eastern with Ping. And, of course, Insightful One couldn't do it without you. And thank you for your super chats and your questions and your kind comments and for helping me find pictures because I am so challenged when it comes to finding stuff and technical things. So thank you, everybody. Check the description for all the links, okay? Okay, love you. See you tomorrow night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.